high. What you're looking at here on my bench is a Hewlett Packard 493A C-band traveling wave tube amplifier. This one is a working unit and I did a teardown with a few years back and I will provide a link in the video description down below for those who are interested. Traveling wave tube is a kind of vacuum tube, but unlike most of the vacuum tubes that have largely become obsolete in an era which is dominated by solid state devices, these specialty vacuum tubes are still in wide use in radars and satellites due to its high bandwidth, high gain, relatively low noise figure, and extremely high reliability. Theoretically speaking, semiconductor devices should have higher reliability as they do not typically age over time, whereas in vacuum tubes, the filament and the cathode material are prone to failures as they age. But uh, in high frequency and high power applications, devices heat display, uh, dissipation and power supply reliability become more challenging and they hinder the overall reliability of power amplifier systems especially in harsh conditions such as those found in outer space applications. But we have seen more and more silicon carbide and uh, gallium nitride based semiconductors used in high frequency power and high power applications over the years. Nevertheless, these microwave vacuum tubes such as magnetron, klystron, and traveling wave tube still have their place in high power microwave applications. I have always been fascinated with these devices and although I studied these in my university years, but I had never seen an actual device close up before. So I picked up another one from eBay and this one is not working. And also I had tested it with uh, parts swapped from this working unit so that I know that uh, the problem of this, the other unit, uh, besides missing a couple of uh, tubes, is that uh, it had a very weak traveling waves tube. So we can take that one apart and see the magic inside. Oh, by the way, before I do the uh, teardown, not sure if you have ever seen a traveling wave tube amplifier in action before. So let me actually first fire it up and uh, let's take a look. And for that, I plugged in this uh, unit and uh, how this works is at first we need to let it on standby. And after it warms up, the high voltage relay would start uh, would start engaging, and you should hear a click. And after that, we can uh, start our uh, measurement. So right now, let me just fire this up. You're gonna be a little bit loud. So while it's uh, powering up, let's uh, prepare the uh, unit for our measurement. I'm just gonna put a uh, adapter on here. Now you just hear, you just heard the uh, clicking noise, and that's when the uh, uh, the power relay actually engaged. So now this uh, traveling wave amplifier is ready to be used. And uh, let me briefly show you the uh, power, the setup I have here. So for that, I'm going to uh, put place this uh, unit backward a little bit so you can see the full picture. Okay, so here is our setup. And towards the top over there is a WaveTech 907. That's the microwave signal generator. And it's a X-band signal generator. So it ranges from seven, roughly seven gigahertz to 11 gigahertz. And now we're outputting about uh, 6.95 gigahertz at uh, minus 31 dBm. And uh, so the signal from that generator comes into the input of this uh, uh, microwave amplifier. Because this 493A is only from 4 GHz to 8 GHz, which is sitting at the C band, so I can only use the lower band of that 907 output. And the output from this 493A is, goes to a detector and then goes to the WaveTech 907 uh, power meter. And that power meter is capable of measuring up to about 18 gig of uh, a frequency range, so this is well within its range. 
So what I'm expecting is that after I power on the uh, 493A, you should see a jump in that uh, dBm reading. Right now it's sitting at minus uh, 65, 64. So let's turn it on. And as you can see, right now we are sitting at uh, minus uh, 5 dBm. So which means that minus 31 uh, dBm signal get amplified roughly 25, 26 uh, dBm. And this is actually on the lower end of what this uh, uh, 493A is capable of when it was new. But right now because it's a uh, age and uh, the emission efi efficiency of the cathode of that tip WT is not as uh, good as when it was new. So that's why the uh, amplification drops below 30 dBm, but uh, in general, this one should be capable of uh, delivering more than 30 dBm's uh, amplification. So just to uh, double check, and uh, now we can see that that's indeed a uh, third, roughly 25 dBm increase in signal strength. So now let me actually uh, connect the input from that uh, wave tech generator directly to uh, the, uh, the detector just to just for reference purpose so for that I'm going to cut the RF power and I'm going to disconnect the sensor and I'm going to connect the output from the generator directly to the detector and as you can see it's uh, more or less uh, tw minus uh, 30 dBm and given that uh, our setup has some variations and also the uh, the cabling and uh, so that is a pretty good reading so roughly speaking we had about 25 dBm's uh, amplification from this uh, traveling wave tube amplifier. We can also put the output signal onto the spectral analyzer to take a look. So for that, let me uh, power up the uh, spectral analyzer. And uh, we should be able to, it's getting quite noisy here, but we should be able to uh, connect So I'm going to connect that back to the input to the 493A and uh, so let me select, first of all, let's select the, uh, the first band, which is um, 2 to 20 sec. So let's do a uh, start. Uh, start frequency, let's do 4 gig, let's do 5 gig, and let's do the uh, stop frequency, let's do 8 gig, and uh, uh, that's good enough, so let me on. So right now you do not see any anything on the uh, the spectrum yet because I haven't uh, powered it on. Actually, let's change the resolution bandwidth down a little bit. So let's uh, do one megahertz. Okay, so now let me turn on the uh, TWT. And um, I can close up the. Uh, I can, let's close it up a little bit. So you can see the tone uh, that is uh, roughly at uh, 0 dBm. And what is interesting is that when I power down the TWT, you can see that the noise floor uh, also rises. So let me uh, turn it off and so you can see better. So now it's off, now it's on. So this is some inherent noise uh, from this uh, amplifier. Anyway, so now you guys have seen uh, this TWT in action, and uh, I'm going to power it down and uh, 
let's uh, open up the other unit that I bought was not working and we'll see what is inside. Now, I suspect that this unit is uh, much older than the, uh, the working unit and you do see there's some design differences. For example, the switch instead of uh, turning up and down, it's moving left and right. And also this uh, meter is faded quite a bit. And uh, from the serial number, it, is, it seems that this one also is much uh, earlier. But uh, the construction should be the same and we will uh, power it down. And also there's something stuck on the meter. You can see uh, actually this is not connected at all. So the meter is just moving by itself. Um, anyway, so this unit is uh, not working as I mentioned earlier. So let's proceed to the uh, teardown. So now we have just open the top and we can clearly see what is inside. So how this unit works is not that complicated. Basically we have some high voltage rectifier section. This provides the voltage needed by this traveling wave tube. And uh, then we have a section that handles the modulation and uh, input signal amplification. So really the core of this unit is just that uh, this tube uh, lying down there, which is our traveling wave tube, which is uh, what we're going to be taking it out and uh, uh, take a good look at. And let's uh, remove this. So my plan for this unit is actually just uh, do an extreme teardown and uh, keep the parts so that I can service the other working version. And I have not powered on this uh, for a long time, so I know that this is not charged, but you really need to make sure that the caps are discharged before trying to poke around in these kind of vacuum tube devices. Because most of the vacuum tubes have a very high anode uh, voltage applied being applied and for the uh, the traveling wave tube we actually have a uh, voltage up to a couple thousand volts floating around so you really need to be very careful when working with these kind of devices but right now we're not uh, connected so a lot of these old units use this kind of a modular design uh, which is actually make uh, maintenance much easier and up here you can see that we have this three pentodes. These are the 8068. They serve as the voltage regulator in series. And uh, then we have these two, uh, the OC2, uh, sorry, OA2 tubes. These are the uh, reference tubes. So what, what they do is they basically are uh, kind of similar to the Zener diodes that we use in uh, lower voltage applications, except these are gas discharge tubes. And uh, here is something that you actually don't see very often. It's a, uh, uh, the delay relay. So basically these are the relays for the 90 seconds uh, startup when, before the, uh, the high voltage was applied. And we have some adjustments. And uh, by the way, this unit actually misses uh, two of the relays. So uh, they don't work. So now let me remove the board on the, uh, the left hand side. Now I just turn the whole thing around 180 degrees. And this board is the modulation board. Basically you can input a signal to modulate the microwave signal. And uh, in, in essence it's just a uh, differential amplifier implemented using uh, vacuum tubes. So again, this is nothing spectacular here. So these are really the, uh, the two main boards. The remaining circuitry is basically just the um, monitoring the traveling wave tube and also the traveling wave tube itself. So let's uh, proceed to removing the, uh, the, the traveling wave tube. And for that I'm going to, I, I'm not sure you can read this or not, but uh, it is actually quite nice that uh, some people before me and put down all the markings on that. So you can clearly see which uh, color corresponds to which uh, uh, terminal. So that's very nice. But um, 
even though that information is uh, uh, in the manual. Okay, so now let's uh, unscrew all these and uh, we want it to remove the traveling wave tube. And for those who haven't seen this before, this is the reverse side. And I need to unscrew these bolts, uh, these screws to free the TWT. But um, take a look at how beautiful the circuit boards are engineered here. And look at all these uh, resistors. And back here we have some transistors that uh, the casing seems to be uh, gold colored. Not sure if those are gold plated or it's just uh, the color. But I think these might be actually gold plated to uh, improve the uh, long term uh, reliability so it doesn't get uh, corroded. And now we have freed that uh, traveling wave stoop. Let's uh, loosen the uh, RF connectors so we can actually take out the, uh, the tube. And now we have freed the uh, traveling wave tube out from its casing. And uh, of course, we're going to take uh, this further down, but uh, here, let's take a look. Watkins Johnson, and uh, it's a uh, four to eight gigahertz, and there's some uh, thermal conductive uh, material at the bottom. And you can see that uh, the voltages are actually printed on it. And these are the operating voltages, so the idea is that you adjust the trim pods on the high voltage supply um, and the various biasing circuitry to make sure that it is in line with what is printed here. Now each of these tubes are individually characterized so that the printed out values are actually all different. But before we, uh, before I move on to take that apart, let's just take a look at the transistors used here. And all these, as you can see at the bottom, are The two N441s here used, these are two germanium transistors, and this one SK309 is another transistor. So nowadays you can't find these uh, transistors anymore, and these are awfully expensive to, to get. But uh, from the date code here, uh, one is from 73, the 12th uh, week, and the one is from 83. So this unit is uh, at least after 83, which uh, is interesting because uh, the other unit, I'm pretty sure, was made around 82, but uh, the serial number of this unit is actually earlier than the other one. So I'm not sure what the deal is. Maybe they had done some repair to this. Um, I don't know. And now we have this traveling wave tube removed. I thought before we uh, take that further apart, let's uh, at least briefly review the working principle of a traveling wave tube. And uh, the actual mechanism is uh, pretty complex and I would strongly recommend you to read a book uh, about it and uh, uh, the book I can think of is uh, Principles of Electron Tubes by Joe Tosky and uh, Watson published in 1965 and that book has a very detailed uh, description and uh, mathematics behind how these kind of things work but uh, in general a uh, traveling wave tube is just a so-called velocity modulated tubes and uh, for the traveling wave tube it's uh, usually constructed with a cathode which uh, we draw here and we have some um, filament here and basically this one generates uh, electron so here we have an opening and the electron get uh, shot out and uh, through the length of the tube so we have a, the tube is somewhere here and we have a target here, which is our anode. So this is our collector. Basically, the uh, voltage applied between the uh, here, that's our acceleration voltage. Now, inside the tube, we have a structure called a helix. Uh, that's a slow wave structure, and I'll explain it very briefly. So this is kind of encasing the, uh, uh, the electron beam 
And uh, at one end, we have the RF coupled in. So this RF in. And at the other end, we have the RF coupled out. And we call it a slow wave structure because uh, when the RF goes through this helix, the actual speed, propagation speed, uh, in this direction is much slower than the speed of light. And because the RF signal has to travel a relatively longer distance, so imagine we're traveling at the speed of C, uh, which is speed of light, along the helix, and the actual speed given uh, from the electron's perspective is actually much slower than C. So long story short is by adjusting the electric field applied here, and so that the electron speed is just uh, slightly faster than the traveling speed of this RF field down the helix. Uh, that's when the uh, energy exchange happens. And uh, you will hear the word bunching of the electrons and also the, electro the electron would transfer the energy uh, from the electron field into the RF field and you get an amplified RF signal out. So it's really um, quite magic and uh, the, the mathematics behind it is quite complex but it all boils down to uh, Maxwell equations for those who are studying RF. Anyway, so I thought I would just give a very short primer on that and uh, now let's uh, move on to take the actual tube apart. So I'm very excited to see what is, uh, what is inside this thing because I have never seen one before. So I think I'm going to remove and you can see that this is a sealed because uh, they don't want you to uh, monkey around here. So I'm going to remove the top. Um, oops. I'm going to remove the top screws first, and we'll see what we get. Because I have no clue whether or not we can open it this way. We have to uh, disassemble the whole thing. Oh, by the way, so I omitted the fact that uh, when the electron beam is traveling through this tube. It has to be uh, focused, so there would be a uh, typically a uh, quadrupole structure of the magnet uh, around this tube to help focusing the electron beam. So we should see a magnet inside, or some magnets inside uh, this uh, traveling wave tube. And uh, I don't think I have seen a uh, teardown if a traveling wave tube before. So this could be the first of its kind. And uh, all these wires are silicone wires, which is uh, quite unusual given that it was made back in the 80s. So now we have four of these screws removed. Shoot. Can we get in now? And I don't think so. So I think we have to uh, further remove all the screws at the end. Oh, by the way, here we have two more. Sorry about that. I'm not sure how much these uh, tubes cost when they were new, but it must be uh, costing a fortune because this has to be individually characterized and, uh, and also they don't have a volume to, uh, to get the cost down. So, all right, so it seems I still have a few more uh, screws need to be removed before I can actually open this up. So let me do that off the camera and uh, I'll be back when I manage to open it. It looks like I still have to remove more, uh, but I, right now I just, uh, so far I have just removed the, uh, the top two covers and one uh, either side, and I don't see uh, any movement yet. So I'm going to keep removing. Let's uh, remove the, uh, the two RF couplers and see what's uh, inside here. And okay, I just removed all the screws to this output uh, SMA connector, and uh, you can see that inside we have a very thick, rigid, coaxial connecting to the output. So 
it looks like we have to uh, further disassemble this unit, uh, this two parts first. But uh, I'm not sure if you can see it. That is the uh, coaxial I'm, we're looking at. It's in, in there. Yep, that, uh, that pipe. And I just removed the uh, input and output uh, coax, the cover, uh, for the, uh, the coax. And you can see that is a nicely machined piece of aluminum. And uh, it's beautiful. Look at that. And now you can see clearly the, uh, the rigid coax used for this input and output. Interestingly, this one is actually pinched. I'm not sure if it's deliberate or not. It doesn't look like it's deliberate. Uh, I did not pinch this, so I'm not sure if this would, uh, would affect the, uh, the performance anyway. But now I can see that the top piece is uh, loose, but it's still not able to totally open it. So, okay, so now I can see, oh, wait, we might just be able to, here we go. All right, so let me uh, uh, lift this up a little bit further and we will clean it up and uh, come back. And I think this might be as far as I can take this apart uh, for now because um, the tube inside seems to be either glued onto the uh, the main casing or there's some, uh, or it's just extremely tight. Unfortunately, if I try to pry it out, it would uh, shatter and uh, break. But uh, for now, we can actually start appreciating what is uh, inside. Now, I did not uh, totally remove the coaxial. It seems that the coaxial is actually uh, soldered after this uh, coaxial being put in through these two slots. So, and let me take a little zoom in here. And I'm not sure if you see this. So we know that the outside is, uh, um, well, the inside, we have some magnets, so these uh, each section of these is actually magnetic, and you can feel that use a screwdriver. But also we have some shards of the uh, some magnets here, so I'm not sure what the deal is. And these are uh, clearly magnets, but uh, I don't know why would they be floating around inside. So we have one piece here, and uh, we have one piece here. Okay, it's another piece. And we, um, I think, I, uh, yeah, we have one more piece here. So the only thing I can think of is uh, they did some kind of uh, calibration afterwards and uh, uh, the certain magnetic field is not strong enough so they have to correct it by putting some of these uh, uh, magnetic pieces material in there. Uh, I'm not totally sure, but uh, that's certainly the only explanation I have as uh, Everything is uh, meticulously put together, and you can look at the machining of this uh, beautiful uh, casing. And uh, so this must have cost a fortune to, to make. And if you look at the uh, anode side, you will see that, uh, if I can focus here, we also have some uh, adjustment. Uh, here, let me move this uh, out of the way. So we also have some adjustment screws. We can do some fine adjustment of the anode plate, uh, presumably here. And um, so this section would be the section that I, uh, in my earlier drawing, uh, actually I can show you here. So that section would be where the helix is, okay? And uh, so the input and output would be directly coupled into and out from that helix uh, slow wave structure. And other than that, this is just a, a vacuum tube uh, inside. And uh, so that is a really amazing. And we have some uh, custom writing here, 462, not sure what that means. Either it's a QA number or it's uh, some uh, specifics uh, that we don't know of. And here also we have some writing 35C2. All right, after uh, some try, and uh, I was able to finally free this from this casing. Actually, it was quite tightly uh, fit inside. Basically, I can, uh, I had to uh, pull it from one side like this. 
so that the whole unit, the whole assembly actually comes out from this groove. So it's like that. Now in the meantime, I also desolder the uh, SMA connectors so that uh, you can see the rigid coax here. So this is actually quite uh, uh, compact, this tube, and considering that this tube would output at least one watt of RF power, while the input is only one millivolt. And so when I was wiggling here, and I noticed that this part actually has a lot of uh, this silicon material, and after I removed that, I could pull this out and check this out. So this is the electric gun version of the uh, of the TWT, and uh, it's just like any other vacuum tube. Basically inside we have a filament and we have some uh, coated uh, cathode material and also we have certain plates here to help uh, forming the, uh, the electron beam. And I'm not actually quite certain how this is uh, uh, connected, whether it's vacuum sealed. It has to be vacuum sealed towards the other end. So I wonder if I somehow broke the vacuum, um, but not entirely sure. The only way to find out is to uh, further open this portion apart. So let me try that to see if I can loosen this up and open it apart. Okay, after a little bit of investigation, it actually appears that I did manage to break uh, this tube and uh, which is evident uh, you can probably see there's a little crack on the top of the glass so so that's uh, why this piece came off and in order to see a little bit more i had to use a dremel to cut off one end because this is the end where the electron gun was uh, uh, housed in and i couldn't see anything from the end, so i cut it off and now you can see that uh, the, actually it did break off right here and uh, basically um, originally this uh, tube is like this okay basically the electron beam get formed inside this electron gun and there are various uh, voltages similar to your vacuum tubes that helps the beam to focus and after that uh, the beam enters a helix actually you can see portions of it right here so this is kind of like springy structure that's uh, I believe part of the helix as you can see that from also from inside this tube depends on the light uh, you might get a glimpse of uh, the first few turns uh, about a eighth of an inch down into that hole so and as you can see that we also have this uh, magnet material for the casing. As mentioned earlier, this magnet material basically uh, creates a magnetic field, uh, which is a, a quadrature magnet arrangement. So it's NS, NS. So basically the field helps the electron beam to stay focused and racing down through this tube. And in the meantime, the RF signal gets uh, passed in from this one end and uh, so travels along the helix and uh, through the, uh, tr uh, down the tube. And uh, when the electron beam, as I mentioned a little earlier, travels down slightly faster than the RF field down the uh, helix, then uh, that's when the energy gets transferred from the uh, beam to the RF field and thus we get a magnified signal coming out from this end. So this tube is certainly a very precise uh, piece of uh, engineering. And, uh, you know, of course I broke it, but uh, it, it was actually made very robust when you think about this. This is a metal tube. Well, the tube itself probably is glass, but uh, it's encased in metal and there's no, uh, it's very rigid. So it probably can withstand a lot of vibration and uh, har in harsh environments. So anyway, I hope you have enjoyed the teardown and also hope you learned something new. And if you liked the video, please uh, give it a big thumbs up and do remember to subscribe, share, and uh, also uh, remember to like. I will catch up with you next time.